very warm welcome to all of you from Tokyo. I'm Yudita Komodor, country representative for Eurasian Japan, and I would like to welcome the audience and our main speaker today, Victoria Babbitt, Director of Research and Development Outreach at Taylor & Francis. So what will you hear about in this webinar? Um, this webinar is organized in collaboration with Taylor & Francis, as you have just heard, and uh, we are very grateful uh, to our main speaker for having designated her time to be with us today. And we will offer a training on how you can become an excellent peer reviewer and understand the process in depth. There will be tips on how to focus on the writing phase in order to speed up the review process. So the categories that you will be uh, hearing about overview of the different types of peer reviewing responsibilities, how to critically assess an article and write an effective report, and what to do if you have any concerns about the reviewing process. At the end of the event, I will give a very brief five-minute um, presentation about MSCA opportunities. I would like to also point out that there will be no long Q&A session, but you will be able to ask your queries during the webinar at some point when Victoria is going to stop for a few minutes. So please submit your questions in the Q&A box in the meantime, so we can actually look at them and answer them as we proceed. So Victoria, the floor is yours. Please go ahead with your presentation. Great, thanks Judith and uh, welcome everyone. Um, before I start today, I just thought I'd let you know, I'm going to turn my camera off during the presentation just because my Wi-Fi here can be a little bit wonky. Um, I'll turn it back on when we have discussions, but don't be surprised when I disappear in a moment. Great. So thanks, Judith, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to do sessions with your access. And welcome to all of you. And greetings from a very cold Copenhagen, where I'm based currently. So as said, we have quite a bit of material to cover today. Um, I ran through this presentation yesterday and it ran a bit over an hour. Um, I will pause throughout just to check if there are any questions. And as Judith said, put them in the Q&A. Um, or if when I pause, you want to ask the question directly, you can just raise your hand. Um, and then I just want to point out at the end of the session, I will discuss our excellence in peer review program and tell you how you can register for that. And that's our, our program where we link uh, reviewers with um, uh, journals. <clears throat> so let's get started. During the webinar today, we're going to be going through the different steps that are involved in the peer review process from the perspective of a reviewer from things to think about before you even receive an invitation through to completing a review. But I always like to point out, while this presentation is focused on the reviewer role, I think a lot of the tips we're giving um, today will apply to authors as well, because it helps you see what reviewers are looking for um, when they're assessing papers. Um, I'd like to start off with just defining what we mean by peer review. And here we have a couple of straightforward definitions of peer review. One is from an organization called Sense About Science, um, which is an independent charity that champions <clears throat> the public interest in sound science and ensures evidence is recognized in public life and in policymaking. So here they say peer review is the evaluation of scientific research findings for validity, significance, and originality by qualified experts who research and submit work for publication in the same field, so peers. And the other one is from the US National Academy of Science. And here they say peer review is a documented critical review for, performed by peers who are independent of the work being reviewed. So they're both basically very similar um, descriptions, but they're highlighting different key aspects of peer review. Number one, that it's conducted by qualified experts. And the other is that those experts need to be independent of the work that's actually being reviewed. Now, hopefully because you're at this webinar, you already are convinced that peer review is an important process. Detailed assessment of articles is essential to ensure that what is published is of sufficient quality and can be trusted. And although it can sometimes feel very challenging from an author's perspective, at its best, peer review is more like a conversation between the reviewers, editor, and authors, where the research can be discussed, improved upon, 
and effectively communicated to the wider research community. As the quote on this slide from Andrew Preston highlights, it's a form of collaboration between experts. And I think it's really easy to forget about that. Peer reviewers must determine if the research is sound science, if the evidence supports the findings, if the research is contributing to the body of literature, if the author is clearly communicating their findings, if the article is a good fit for the journal, if it's following the journal guidelines, if it's novel research, and if there are any ethical issues. With the increase of manuscripts submitted annually, the diverse areas of research and the global nature of the academic community, it is unrealistic to think that an editor could make all these decisions on their own. They're not going to have the expertise in all the subject areas and the emergent fields of study. So they need to depend on external experts who can evaluate the content. Peer review helps to improve the research and communication of the findings through recommendations. And lastly, peer review validates the research. The editors and peer reviewers, when accepting a paper, are giving it a stamp of approval, confirming that it is indeed sound science. So starting at the very beginning, let's first remind ourselves of what is involved in a peer review process. So here's a summary of the main elements of a peer review process. Different journals will have slightly different approaches, but most of the key aspects will be the same. The process starts when an author submits their article to a journal for assessment. And there will be some initial checks to ensure that the article fulfills the basic requirements for the journal and that all the required information is included. If those checks are okay, then the editor will usually make an initial assessment on whether the article is a good fit for the journal and suitable for, for peer review. Now, if the editor has concerns or feels that the article is not suitable for the journal, then they would reject at this point. And this is called a desk reject. And that usually happens quite quickly, usually within one to two weeks. But if they feel that the article can proceed, then it will be sent out to external reviewers. There are usually at least two reviewers who give comments on an article, and these reviewers are selected to be independent experts. Once the reviewers have made their assessment, the article goes back to the editor with their comments, and the editor makes a decision on whether the authors need to revise their article, whether it should be rejected, or whether it's suitable for publication. Very few articles are suitable for publication immediately. And in most cases, there needs to be at least some revisions in response to the comments from the reviewers. Focusing on the peer review stage specifically, as a reviewer, it's really important for you to know what type of peer review the journal that you are reviewing uses. The most common type of peer review, which you're likely to encounter, is single anonymous or single blind peer review. In this model, the reviewers know who the authors are, but the authors do not know who the reviewers are. Although this is the most common approach to peer review, there are some concerns about whether this approach does enough to prevent bias in the peer review process. If the reviewers know who the authors are, then could their identity unfairly affect the reviewer's opinion in any way? Now, one approach to addressing concerns about potential bias is double anonymous or double blind peer review, where the authors don't know the identity of the reviewers and the reviewers also don't know the identity of the authors. The argument for this approach is that the reviewers will assess the article on the basis of the research alone because they won't know the identity of the author. However, a study by O'Connor et al. in 2017 did highlight that attempting to hide an author's identity isn't always that easy, whether it's a writing style or just general knowledge of who's working on what in a niche field. A double anonymous peer review process doesn't always guarantee that the reviewers will not be able to, to identify an author. Now, another approach to address potential bias in peer review is to completely open up the process. In open peer review, reviewers know who the authors are, and once the review process is complete, the authors will know the identity of the reviewers. 
Some journals also publish the reports written by the reviewers with, um, along with the published article. And the idea behind this approach is to increase transparency so that everyone knows what the reviewer said about a published paper and who said it. And evidence also suggests that reviewers provide more details to support their comments in open peer review, which can be really beneficial to the authors. Open peer review does not affect the quality of peer review. Our F1000 platform is a really good place to see the process live. And I'll share the link um, in a later slide so that you can check that out after this session if you're interested. So in just a moment, we're going to have two questions for you to answer. In each case, you'll see a question with the different options um, for responses on the screen. So I'd like you to please select your responses and we'll keep the poll open for about 20 to, 20 to 30 um, seconds to give everyone time. There we go. So we have two questions here. And the first one is, which type of peer review would you prefer as an author? So single anonymous, where the reviewer know, um, where you as a reviewer know the identity of the, um, sorry, as an author where the reviewer knows your identity, but um, you don't know the identity of a reviewer or double anonymous where all identities are hidden or open. And then the second one is the same question, but from the perspective of being a reviewer, which would you prefer? Would you prefer to know the identity of the author of the paper you're assessing, or would you prefer that identity be hidden, or would you like it open? And this is really interesting because what we're seeing is that there seems to be just general preferences here in terms of what type of peer review you prefer. So we have three people that prefer single anonymous, irrespective of role, of oh, four people. Oh, it's an even split across. So four people pr prefer single anonymous. No, now we have five people preferring double anonymous and then four people preferring open. Great, thanks. That is really interesting results because we run this poll and have run it quite regularly over the years. And this is what we usually see. We tend to see differences between that perspective of being an author and the perspective of being a reviewer. So for authors, um, um, for the most part, we've seen that they prefer double anonymous or open peer review. And I think it is that concern about bias. Um, and then for reviewers, the preference is single anonymous, of course, hiding the identity or double anonymous against, again, hiding your identity or open peer review. But here we're, we're seeing something different. So that's quite interesting. Great. So considering all the expectations which are placed on reviewers, you might be left with the question, why would I want to be a peer reviewer? Or what are the benefit? What benefits do I get from being a peer reviewer? Now, surveys have indicated that the majority of researchers get involved in peer review because they feel that it is a part of their role as an academic and due to the interest in the articles that they're sent to assess. However, there are also some potential direct benefits in terms of the connections which can be made. Many researchers also find that reviewing others' work improves their own writing. It's an opportunity to consider how reviewers might view your own articles and develop an alternative perspective. It can also be the case that when journals are recruiting new members to their editorial boards, that they will look at those who have been frequent reviewers for them. And I've seen this time and again when I'm at editorial board meetings and they're trying to expand their board. They start talking about people that have really contributed to the journal over the years in terms of peer reviewing. In addition to the indirect benefits, many journals will also provide some recognition to those who are involved in peer review for them. The precise details will depend on the journals, so it's important for you to look at either the journal website or the invitation email for specific information. In general, evidence indicates that direct financial awards for peer review are not valued by researchers, but journals may offer access to journal content or recognition such as a published thank you, listing all of those who have reviewed for the journal over the last year. As well as offering these kinds of rewards, many journals also support reviewers in linking the review activity to their publons or ORCID profiles. So this enables reviewers to share that they have completed a review for a particular journal without sharing the details of the article itself. 
and then thus gaining recognition for your contribution as a reviewer. Right, so we're now going to move on to what we need to consider when we receive a review. But before I do that, I'll just pause to see if there are any questions about the different types of peer review. I don't see anything. Nope, okay. Um, again, if you have any questions, raise your hand or put them in the chat and I will um, try and address them as we go. Great, so I've mentioned the editor a couple of times already, but who do we mean and who else might be involved in the peer review process? Well, different journals will have different editorial structures. On some journals, there might be a single editor in chief who handles all aspects of the journal and inviting reviewers. While in other journals, there may be subject level editors such as section editors or associate editors who directly oversee articles in their subject area. Or there might be a guest editor overseeing some articles in a journal. Whichever editor is inviting you as a reviewer, they'll likely be primarily looking for potential reviewers by searching published literature for people whose publication as an author shows that they are an expert in that particular area. Review, uh, editors might also approach, uh, use other approaches um, to finding potential reviewers, such as searching their journal database using AI tools. But if they're not already familiar with your expertise as a potential reviewer, then it's likely that they will aim to judge this from what you have published as an author and possibly any additional information that they can find about you on your institutional website or online profiles. So if you're interested in receiving invitations to review, then it's a good idea to keep your online presence up to date with your expertise and any subject, any um, subject level, mm, sorry. There's some kind of quirk in my um, deck that it always flips over to the next uh, slide before I'm done with this slide. Anyhow, um, uh, right. So it's a good idea to keep your online presence up to date with your expertise and any subject keywords that describe your interests. Each journal will have its own criteria for selecting reviewers in terms of their level of expertise and the number of publications. The key aspect here is that the editor does need some way to be able to determine your expertise to assess that article. Now, in terms of publications, editors would ideally like to see recent publications. They would like to know that you are currently active and up to date on the current literature. A review invitation will usually be an email from a journal. So do look closely at that email as it should have the core information in it, which you will require, including the name of the journal, the title and the abstract of the article that they want you to assess and other important information, such as the type of peer review and the deadline, i.e. if you agree to review, then how long will you have to complete your report? So before you agree to review, you should look at all of this information and consider whether you can review the article. In particular, from the title, abstract, and any other information that the editor has provided, do you think you have the expertise required? We noted earlier that the editor will be aiming to assess your expertise from information like your previous publications. Have they assessed your expertise correctly? Do bear in mind that for some research, such as interdisciplinary research, the editor may have to invite several different reviewers to assess different aspects of an article. So consider whether there is a particular method or technique which you may want your views on, such as statistical or ethnographic methods. It is also important to consider whether you may have a conflict of interest regarding the article. That is any connection with the article, the author's subject area or funding, which could affect your assessment and mean that you can't provide an unbiased report. And if you cannot review for any reason, then it is absolutely fine to say no. The editor will be hoping that you will accept the invitation, but they would prefer a quick decline rather than a report which doesn't help them make a decision. And when you respond to the invitation, you may have the option to choose either decline or unavailable. 
Decline will indicate to the editor that you would not have agreed to review the article at any time. Maybe your expertise is not right, or you have a conflict of interest, which means you couldn't review. You might be able to add some more details, such as updating the keywords written to your subject area in the journal system, or give a reason for declining, which will enable the editor to match your expertise better next time. Alternatively, if you say unavailable, then you are indicating to the editor that you would have reviewed the article, but that you're just not available. And the author and readers will also have expectations of the reviewers. The editor will hope that the reviewer will provide a report which will give them the information they need to make a decision on the article, while the authors will be looking for constructive and helpful feedback. The readers of the journal will be looking to the reviewers to provide a thorough assessment of the article, which means that they can trust what is published. And also, what is finally published includes all the details of the article you've been sent to review with anyone without discussing it with the journal first. If you want more detailed guidance on the important considerations when being a peer reviewer, then I'd recommend the COPE Ethical Guidelines for reviewers, which are a fantastic resource. And I'll uh, provide a link to this um, resource on the final slide. So next we are going to discuss what happens after you accept an invitation. What um, is important to look at when you're assessing an article. And I don't see any questions at this point, so I'll just continue on. Now, during the assessment of an article, there will be four things which you will broadly be looking for as a peer reviewer. First and foremost is the validity of the study. It is important to determine whether the research has been soundly conducted and whether the conclusions are appropriate for the results obtained. Second, you'll be looking for the quality of the presentation. Overall, as a reviewer, it's not your responsibility to copy edit the paper, but you should be looking at whether the presentation enables research to be understood. Third, you'll be looking at the contribution of the research, determining if this work um, is adding to the knowledge of the research community. And finally, some journals may also wish for you to comment on the novelty of the research and whether this is a unique contribution, but not necessarily all journals. Some will just wanna know if the research is sound. This information might be shared in the invitation or you'll be able to find it in the journal website in the aims and scope statement or in the instructions for authors. Now, I have deliberately separated out research significance from novelty here because a piece of work could be significant if it provides a replication of a previous finding, proving that the research is reproducible. That might not count as original, but it is certainly important. And different journals will emphasize different areas they want you to look at, with some primarily focused on the validity of the research and others wanting more details on the originality. But before you start looking into the details of the article, it's important to consider what type of research article you've been sent to review. It's likely that the majority of the articles you receive will be research articles, but whether the research is empirical or theoretical will affect how you consider the article. If you're looking at empirical research where there has been data collection and analysis, then the methods used for that will be a key aspect of your analysis. By contrast, for theoretical research, the considerations as a reviewer will not be on data collection, but rather on the theoretical framework and the flow of the argument of the paper. Peer review in this context is less about verification and more about discussing the concepts and assertions of the article. And although the majority of articles you receive to review will be research articles, you might also be sent other types of articles to review. And it's important to check what type of article it is before you start. As again, you want to focus, um, the focus um, in your paper might be a bit different. If you aren't sure what the requirements are for a particular article type of a a particular type of an article, then a great resource is the journal's instructions for authors, 
Those should detail the different types of articles that the journal will consider and any specific points that you might need to consider in your review. And these are just a few different examples of the types of articles that you might come across. So taking some time to work out what type of article you're assessing or the type of research is all about getting an overview of the article before digging into the details. It's also a good idea to get an overall sense of the flow of the article before you start. So look at the key elements, in particular, the abstract, the introduction, the methods and figures, if you're assessing empirical research, and the conclusions. That should give you an outline and a sense of what the paper is focused on. Then I'd recommend reading the paper all the way through, not going into the detail yet, but getting an overview and a sense of the flow and the key assertions of the paper. And once you have this overview, it'll be easier for you to go through the paper in more detail, section by section, looking at the different elements and making detailed notes, which will um, inform your report. And once you have an overview of the article, it's time to assess in greater detail. I've already mentioned that you need to consider whether you're assessing empirical or theoretical research. And I just want to go into a bit more detail about what you might expect from these different types of research. If you're assessing an empirical study, then what the authors have reported in each section of the article will be important. As you look through the paper in detail, you can consider what is required from each section and what you should be able to understand from reading that section. Overall, for the four main sections of the paper, introduction, methods, results, and discussion, you, you are expecting to be able to see why the, re uh, the study was relevant and what the authors did, what they found, and then a balanced discussion, which is based on the results obtained and answering in some way the question posed at the beginning of the article. So to help with this process, Taylor and Francis has created a number of checklists for different types of articles um, and research. And I'll share a link to those on the um, final slide because they can really help um, guide you through that um, process a bit. We'll see some examples of the checklist moving forward. And here's a partial checklist for the introduction. So besides the abstract, the first part of the article you're likely to assess is the introduction. The introduction should provide readers with the information needed to understand the study and the reasons why the authors conducted their experiments. It should give the background of the research and summarize the current state related to the topic. The introduction should introduce the gaps and limitations in the current understanding or conflicts in current knowledge but it's not meant to be a literature review. Then it should state the main question for the study, give the readers the purpose of the study. Finally, the introduction should clearly set out the aims of the study, why the study was carried out. Next, let's take a look at the methods section. A quantitative method section should be reproducible, scientifically sound, reliable, and following best practice. All of the different elements need to be assessed. So the equipment, experimental details, sample collection, design principles, statistical analysis, and ethical concerns, et cetera. If any software has been used, it should be clearly described and available for readers to replicate experiments. Likewise, with data, if the journal has an open data policy, it should be available in an established repository. This won't be relevant for all types of research, especially within the social science and humanities, but it might be the case for um, those that are data heavy, such as economics. Again, this information will be available on the journal website under the instructions for authors. For each detail, we can ask some questions to help understand if the paper needs a revision. So again, this is from our checklist, and here's just a couple examples, such as, is there enough detail to repeat the experiment? Are the correct controls validation included? Um, is the time frame of the study sufficient to see outcomes, et cetera? Um, great. 
Within empirical research, if you are in the social science humanities or some other fields of research, it's also likely that you'll see articles presenting qualitative data. Examples of qualitative data would uh, include results from surveys or focus groups, interviews, et cetera. A lot of the aspects you will need to think about will be the same as other empirical research articles, but in your analysis of the methods, a piece of qualitative research you'll want to consider, um, you'll want to consider elements such as the sample size, how participants were approached, and whether there could be any bias in the sample. Also, whether the questionnaire or other tools used have been validated. We've been discussing empirical research, but you may be asked um, to review a theoretical paper. For theoretical research, the most important elements for you to assess as a reviewer will be around the flow of the article. In some ways, the structure is even more important in theoretical research than empirical. An author can organize the paper around different themes, schools of thought, time periods, et cetera, but there needs to be a strong structure that supports the main objectives of the work and overall argument. Have the authors place the topic in the appropriate wider context or argument? Um, um, is the argument progressing in a clear manner? Are the conclusions derived from the main discussion with any limitations or open questions addressed? These kinds of questions you'll want to ask yourself as a reviewer, and they'll depend upon the type of work you're assessing. But overall, you will be considering whether the work is clearly presented and that any limitations are clearly stated. You will want to make sure that the researchers here have either utilized existing arguments or schools of thought, or if they disagree, shown their awareness of this and rationalized their decision in a rigorous and a robust fashion. You don't uh, necessarily have to agree with their conclusions, so long as their justification for the argument is sound and supported. So I'd like to briefly address the literature review because we often have questions about this. While most published articles contain a review of previous contributions to a research area, literature reviews are quite central to the humanities and social science papers. So literature reviews should be well-structured and focused on the main themes of the paper. They are the foundations of the paper, showing where the article is making a contribution to the field, who it is in, and who it is in conversation with. As a reviewer, you should be looking to see that the reviews contain references to foundational studies on the topic of the paper, but also feature recent contributions to the subject area. If the citations are all rather old, the paper's likely missing key developments in the field. You'll also wanna pay attention to irrelevant referencing. Every reference should be supporting the overall objectives of the paper and the argument of the paper. Lastly, I'd like to focus a bit on the discussion and conclusion. The discussion and conclusion should tie all the different parts of the paper together. For the discussion, you should be assessing whether the author has interpreted what they found in a sensible manner and linked their findings to other work in the area, either contrasting or supporting it. There should be links back to the literature review in terms of the work they are comparing their findings to. You'll also wanna ask yourself whether the conclusions are supported by the data or discussion provided in the article. In a strong paper, the discussion and the conclusions will correspond and bolster the aims presented in the introduction and supported by the literature review, if you have one, and the method section. New ideas or objectives shouldn't be introduced at this point. The conclusion ideally would be in direct dialogue with that introduction. The conclusion is also an area where the authors can articulate the limitations of the research and the next steps. You'll need to consider if there are limitations to the work and if the author has noted that in the conclusion. You'll find additional questions in the checklist. Again, there's a little sample of it there. So over the next few slides, I'm gonna share some example review comments from articles from our F1000 um, platform. So for F1000, the peer review is fully open and available online. And as you can see, the reports are also citable. 
This is a great resource if you want to see the peer review process happening live, as the responses from authors are also included. So I'd really encourage you to follow the links to these, these examples afterwards, just so you can see these comments um, in context. In this first slide, I've included one of the points related to methods, um, to the method section of the article from the report. The comments are focused on asking authors to provide more details about the research done. And the reviewer has included a reference to support their questions. And it's clear that adding these details to the article will likely help the reporting of the study. So I'll just give you a second to read these comments. Great. In this slide, both of the comments are, uh, the reviewers are asking questions to clarify details in the article. And this is a common request that reviewers make and highlights that as a reviewer, many of the comments that you make to authors are likely to be in the form of questions. You'll be asking uh, the questions that anyone reading the article might ask so that they can be clarified before publication. You may notice that the comments from the second report included here are quite direct, and we'll come back to phrasing comments a little bit later, but it is useful to note that the reviewer could potentially have phrased these comments in a slightly different way, still raising the same questions, but using less critical phrasing. So one of the example reports we just looked at included a reference to back up the comments, and it may be that as a reviewer, you think that the author um, has missed some key references. This leads us to onto the interesting question of whether you think it's suitable as a reviewer for you to ask the authors to cite your own work. So I'm going to launch another poll here. You had a brief preview of the question earlier. So the question here is, is it okay to recommend that authors cite your paper? The first answer is yes, but you need to be careful that they can't identify who, oh, you can't see that whole thing, that they can't identify um, who you are, basically. Uh, the second is no, it's never okay. Third is yes, as long as the papers are relevant to the article. And the fourth answer is yes, as long as you don't ask them to cite too many. So here we have a couple of people say yes, but you need to be careful that they can't identify, you know, uh, basically identify you. Um, the second one is no, it's never okay. And the third um, and most popular is yes, as long as the papers are. I want to now focus on a few questions about what should uh, what you should be looking for as a reviewer. One question which comes up is to what extent reviewers should assess the language in an article. When you receive an article to review, it is natural that you may notice errors in spelling or grammar. However, as a reviewer, correcting these aspects of an article shouldn't be your main focus. As long as the research is understandable, the editor needs your expertise on the details of the research, and copy editing can be done later by the journal if needed. Now, if you do have concerns that the language in the article makes the research hard to understand, then you can let the editor know that language revisions are required in your comments to the editor. Alternatively, if you're having trouble reviewing due to the language, then you might wish to contact the editor and recommend that some language revisions be completed before further peer review takes place to enable the research to be clearly understood. Just to note that a bad reviewer spends time picking apart the language rather than considering the arguments. You're being invited to review a paper because you're an expert in the field, not because you're a master of grammar and spelling. Now, another question which is frequently discussed is what role um, of peer review, uh, what is the role of peer review in detecting unethical behavior? And we've all seen cases where published papers have been retracted due to concerns about data, overlaps with previous work or other issues. It is hoped that such issues will be identified in advance through the assessment process of the journal, but what is your role specifically as the peer reviewer? Overall, as a reviewer, you shouldn't feel under pressure to identify all issues related to ethical concerns or misconduct. 
The primary purpose of peer review is to assess the quality and the validity of the research presented. And reviewers are not expected to identify every potential ethical issue. However, it's also the case that as a peer review, you are looking at that article very closely, and it's possible that you will therefore identify problems which others have missed. So it's important to know what you might see and what action you should take. Here are some of the potential problems you might come across. There are issues with the research and writing process, such as fabrication or falsification of data, plagiarism, and and research ethics relating to how this study was conducted. Then we have publishing misconduct, which could be submitting the same article to a number of journals at the same time. Excuse me, at the same time, or other types of misconduct, such as authorship issues not stated, um, authorship issues are not stating conflicts of interest. Now, unfortunately, these are just a few of the issues that we see on a regular basis. Um, eth ethics issues are on the rise, um, and it's very time-consuming tackling them. But these are probably some of the more common ones that you may come across. Now, if you do think you see any of these issues or anything else that concerns you, then the only thing you need to do is contact the journal with your concerns. As a reviewer, you should not be investigating potential ethical concerns. Um, you should just let the journal or editor know what your concerns are using very neutral language so that you're not accusing the author of anything. And you should let the journal investigate. If your concern is very immediate, then you might wanna uh, email the editor directly. Alternatively, you might include some details in your confidential comments to the editor as a part of your report. For example, some reviewers asked me if they should run, uh, be running articles through plagiarism detection software themselves to check for potential issues. The answer is no. The journal will run these types of checks um, as required. The key responsibility for you as a reviewer is to just let the journal know if you notice anything which concerns you about an article that you're assessing. So we've covered how to assess an article, what criteria you should focus on, and some of the res your responsibilities as a peer reviewer. Now we're going to move on to focus on how to write a report. Um, but I'll just pause to see if there are any questions here yet. No, no questions. Great. Right. So when you write a report, usually you will need to complete it uh, in a review form on an online peer review system for the journal. Even if you plan to write your report and then paste it in, it can be helpful to look at the form in advance so that you know exactly what questions the journal wants you to answer. In some cases, uh, review forms may have structured questions which you need to answer. In other cases, there may be a free, free text box for comments, first to the authors and then one for the editors. And the comments to the editors are confidential. Here, I'm going to primarily focus on how to structure. Um, oh, right. And then there's also an area to give a recommendation on a publication uh, decision. Here, I'm primarily going to focus on how to structure a report where you have a free text option for your comments. But it is important to look carefully at the requirements of the journal that you're reviewing for. So first, let's consider the comments to the authors. If you've been given a free text box, then it's helpful for both the author, uh, editor and the author if you structure your comments. Some reviewers add headlines, some follow a structure, but don't explicitly include these headlines. I'd recommend that you start your comments with a brief summary of the research. This helps to focus your review and it shows that you've understood the work which has been presented. One approach is to then detail any comments you have as major and minor comments. Major comments would be any significant queries which you have about the article. These would be essential points that the author would need to address before the article would, um, could be published, like problems with study design or issues with the overall presentation of the research, interpretation, analysis, or data. 
minor comments would be points which are not essential for the validity or reliability of the study, but which could improve the work. For example, missing references, technical clarifications, or unclear labeling of figures and tables, that sort of thing. An alternative approach to structuring a report is to give headlines for the different sections of the article and to group the comments together, which are relevant for each section. This is also a good approach. If you choose to group your comments by section, then do make it clear for the authors and editors which of your comments are essential for them to address and which are just minor comments, recommendations for improvement. Here's an example of a polite, well-organized and specific report. It is clearly structured using the section headings approach. This example starts and ends with summaries and bullet points specific comments under each section, giving page and line numbers to help guide the authors. So while you're reading, I, I see that there's a couple of questions that came in. So I'll address those really quickly. So the first one is, sorry if my question is simple, but how many times can I submit the same article to a company? I mean, if they've rejected it first or I got several requests for reviews, how many reviews do they ask? So um, when you think about submitting an article, you need to think about submitting it to a journal, not to a company. So you're not submitting it to Taylor and Francis, for example. You're finding different journals to submit your article to. Now, if you've submitted the article and they've rejected, they might have a couple different decisions. Um, one will be reject. Um, with no option to resubmit. In that case, you wouldn't be able to resubmit to that journal. You need to find another journal to submit to. But sometimes they do have the option, we'll talk about that in a moment, reject and resubmit. Then you could do the significant work that you need to do on the article and then resubmit it to that um, journal. Um, and in terms of how many reviews do journals ask for, most journals look to um, have two external reviewers review a paper. Some have more. Um, some journals ask for three. Um, so it does vary a little bit, but it's usually at least two external reviewers that they ask. And then the other question is, can I recommend myself to a publisher as a reviewer? Absolutely. We'll talk about our program at the end, but if you feel that you are able to review, you have expertise in the area, what you want to do is think about what journals are appropriate for you to review. Um, based on your area of expertise. And then you can always send a letter to the editor with your CV, um, you know, explaining your interest in becoming a peer reviewer for that journal. Um, they will welcome it. Editors are always looking for more reviewers. Great. So let's get back to the presentation. So Coming back to the comments for uh, to the authors, remember that the purpose of comments to authors is both to help the authors to improve their article and to give the editor key information about the work so they can make an informed decision. The comments are addressed to the author, but the editor can also see these comments. So you don't need to repeat the comments to the authors in your comments to the editors. And when you're writing your comments, consider the fact that you're aiming to be constructive so think about what will help the author to identify what they need to do. Being specific and referring to particular page and line numbers in the article can be especially helpful. Also, consider that the authors are likely to be writing a point-by-point -point response to your comments, which you might be assessing at re-review. So numbering your comments can be really helpful to enable that ongoing communication. So moving on to your comments to the editor. These are confidential and will not be passed on to the authors. So they are an opportunity for you as a reviewer to raise any issues that you would not be appropriate to raise directly with the author. For example, you could make a more general comment about the suitability of the article for the journal, um, alternative Alternatively, if you have any concerns regarding ethical aspects of an article, then you can raise these in your comments to the editor um, or with the language. If you feel like the language needs to be improved, this is a place where you could raise that. Now, bear in mind, these comments will not be passed on to the authors and also that the editor can see your comments to the authors. So you don't need to duplicate details here, which you put in your comments to the authors, but equally, don't put something in your comments to the editors 
um, which actually the authors need to, uh, to directly address. The space for the comments to the editors should be specifically for issues that they need to um, address, that need to be raised with them, nothing that concerns the author. It's also important to note that you don't need to make any spe uh, specific comments to the editor if you don't have anything to add to your comments, which will be shared with the authors. In most systems, comments to the editor, um, the comments to the editor box will be optional, and it's okay to leave it blank. It's not a problem. Now, it will depend on the specific journal exactly what the recommendation terms are and whether these um, are seen by the author or the editors. Um, and not every journal will ask for recommendations, but most journals these days do ask for your recommendations on, um, on the decision for the paper. And most recommendations follow four categories, accept, minor revision, major revision, and reject. Though some journals will also have reject and resubmit, which I just mentioned in my response to the question. So um, what you wanna do is really read what your options are carefully, and the key thing is to ensure that your recommendation reflects the type of concerns you've raised in your comments and indicates to the editor what you think the next steps for the article should be. For example, if there are only some clarifications required, which you feel the author could easily address, then you will probably want to recommend a minor revision. If you have questions which are essential, um, for the authors to address in order for the article to be considered a sound piece of research, then you may want to recommend major revisions. Whether you recommend minor or major revisions can also be an indication for the editor about the level of further assessment that might be needed after the authors have made the changes and how confident you are that the article is likely to be suitable for publication. Major revisions indicates that you're not sure if the article will be suitable or not, and that the revisions need careful assessment before a final decision is made. Now, sometimes it can be difficult to choose between different recommendations, in particular between major revisions or a reject uh, recommendation. A key question to ask yourself is, how long the, res, uh, the revisions are likely to take and how reasonable is it that the authors would be able to complete those revisions. For example, if you think that the authors need to do a small additional survey, but it would be quick and easy to complete and they're likely to have the resources available to do it, then major revisions would be a reasonable recommendation. However, if there was a problem which meant that a major part of the article needed redoing, which might take more time than um, is realistic, or where the authors might not be able to make the change, then recommending rejection is suitable. Essentially, if you think that the author could make the changes in a reasonable amount of time, then recommending revisions is fair. And I say reasonable amount of time because different disciplines, that time window, can vary quite a bit. Some disciplines, you know, they would expect revisions to come back in a month. Other disciplines, especially in the social sciences and humanities, the revisions process takes longer amount of time, mainly due to the fact that it is text heavy and that sort of thing. Here's an example of a poor report. To begin with, it's not very specific. And second, it's inconsistent. The recommendation and the comments don't match up. The review the reviewer has only has ticked reject and resubmit, but only minor comments about the references have been made. You can also see that the comments to the authors have been unnecessarily repeated in the comments to the editors. Since the editor can see the comments to the authors, that's completely unnecessary. A much better report is this example from F1000. In this report, the reviewer has recommended approval of the article with no changes, and it's a brilliant example of the right way to do this. When there are no changes, sometimes the reviewers just give the editors one line saying that everything's fine, which leaves the editors and the authors wondering if the reviewer really read the work. Here, the reviewer has taken the time to give some comments on the positive aspects of the work, which is really encouraging for the author, but also demonstrates that the reviewer has read and understood the article. So it's clear that their recommendation is based on a thorough assessment.
So I just have a few final thoughts on being a reviewer. First, when you're completing your reviews, it's good to make sure that you review as you want to be reviewed. And this is um, something that one of our editors said to us, and I really like that. The peer review process can feel very challenging from an author's perspective, as you well know. When you're reviewing, consider what it would be like to receive that report as an author. Would it be helpful and encouraging and help you improve your work if you were the author? If not, then consider whether you can address your comments in a different way. As we mentioned earlier, after you and your fellow reviewers finish your reports, all the review reports are then sent to the editor and they will make their decision on the article. It's important to remember that whatever your recommendation, the editor will make the final decision on the next steps for the article. And that outcome might be in agreement with your recommendation or they might decide that the authors could be given the opportunity to revise when you've recommended reject. The editor will be considering the views and comments of all the reviewers, as well as their own assessment and knowledge of the journal. So don't be offended if they decide something different to you. If you have concerns that the editor missed something important, then you can always contact them and politely ask for some more information about their decision. Now, everything we've talked about so far has been focused on the first time you see a particular article for review. However, after the authors have responded to your comments and made their revisions, the editor may also ask you to re-review to see whether your concerns have been addressed. At this stage of the process, the focus should be on assessing the author's response to the original concern. So it's best if you as the original reviewer are able to do it uh, where needed. The editor doesn't want to have to find a new reviewer at this stage, and it should be considered a part of the original commitment to review, which we discussed earlier. On this slide, you can see a comment and response for an article um, on F1000, where the author has provided an explanation. Remember that if the author has not made a change you asked for, then assess their explanation neutrally and don't take it personally. They might have a good ex explanation for doing something different. Also, raise don't raise new concerns at the re-review stage unless it's about something that is either very critical to the soundness of the article or you couldn't have seen it in the first review. For example, if the authors added new data or new interpretations in the revisions. As an author, you don't want to be stuck in a cycle of continually responding to changing reviewer comments, which you could have addressed at an earlier revision. As a reviewer, agree to re-review and focus on the changes made to avoid putting the authors in that position of kind of this constant roller coaster of responding to uh, different comments. So we're coming to the end of the presentation now, and I just wanted to summarize the top tips for being an effective reviewer to take away from this session. First, it's okay to say no to an invitation. Editors will hope that you say yes, but if you can't review, and especially if you can't review in a timely manner, then they would rather that you quickly de decline the invitation. If you do agree, then start by getting an overview and then get into the details, paying particular attention to the elements that are important to the type of research, whether that be empirical or theoretical. So literature review, methods, data, or materials, or discussion section. Clearly structure your report, starting with a summary and making it clear which comments are essential. And when you're writing a report, think about what it would be like to receive that report as an author and review as you would want to be reviewed. And finally, if you have any problems or questions, get in touch with the journal as they're there to help you. So I mentioned at the beginning that I would um, highlight our Excellence in Peer Review Network. If you are interested and you have the relevant experience, we would encourage you to join our Excellence in Peer Review Network. To join, you just need to take a short quiz, it takes about five minutes max, to show that you understand how peer review works and the responsibilities of being a peer reviewer. Then we have a questionnaire for you to fill out listing your information. So affiliation, publications, keywords to describe your research, et cetera. Um, and, and there you can note which journals you feel you have the right expertise to review for from our list of journals that are part of our program. 
Our team and the editors will then review your information. And if you meet the requirements, you'll be linked to the journal you selected. And once you're linked, you'll be invited to review a paper and we'll give you feedback on the first couple of reviews you complete. And once you've completed a couple of acceptable reviews, you'll be certified as an experienced reviewer in our system. So you'll get a little badge in our system so that people know that you're a trained reviewer. So um, again, I, I'll be sharing these slides with everyone. So the links are there. And then I have one last slide with um, a few of the resources I've mentioned today um, that you can check out. So we've got the peer review guidelines um, from our site. We've got the reviewer checklist and then we've got those COPE guidelines. And that is it for me. A wealth of yeah. information. Submit your query in the Q&A box. We would very much appreciate that you as an author and you don't have time to do the rewrite um, requested in a peer review is did i understand that question correct um i'm i'm guessing so yeah i, I don't know it's anonymous so i don't really know who wrote it but uh let me see if we got an answer right i mean if you got if you received comments that you need to significantly uh oh the question just um disappeared but basically you need to address the concerns of the reviewers um, I know time is time is very scarce in the academic life. We all know that with teaching and and all the other requirements. If you're a PhD student, you might still be doing coursework or doing research. It's, it's really difficult. It's a really challenging time. But if you want to get the article published, you're 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 going to have to do the work. Um, <laughs> uh, it's 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 probably not the answer you want to hear, but but it it is the reality. Yes, indeed. The presentation will be available online on our portal page. It was a wealth of knowledge. Um, rather interesting because there are so many details that you do not think about, you know, when you when you write or when you review, you know, text. And yeah. unless you are a seasoned writer or peer reviewer, mm -hmm. you know, these uh, tips are super useful for uh, people in the early stages of their career, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, that's why I always say it, it's good for peer reviewers, but it also is good to think about as a writer too. Okay, these are the types of things peer reviewers are looking at. Okay, well, in that case, thank you very much for the very extensive explanation on how, how to become a peer reviewer. Hopefully, we will get several queries and emails about uh, this webinar. And um, let me just conclude with a very brief presentation on MSCA. Say so a few words about MSCA grants and Horizon Europe uh, funding opportunities. As you know, Horizon Europe is a, a funding scheme of the European Commission, and within that, MSCA grants are one of the most uh, prestigious ones. So MSCA stands for Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions, and I would like to highlight opportunities for third country organizations and researchers. It refers to countries which are not associated to Horizon Europe. And Japan actually falls into that category at this point. Going into more detail, these are the different types of actions, doctoral networks, postdoctoral fellowships, staff exchanges, co-fund, MSC and citizens. What do they actually cover? Well, the doctoral networks require partner organizations, but they do not re receive funds directly. The beneficiaries uh, are not required, but in third country organizations, you can, as you can see, recruit, monitor, and train, train pre-doctoral staff within the doctoral networks, receive pre-doctoral researchers for short stays. With staff exchanges, the host research staff from EU member states and from associated countries can receive one up to 12 months to cover the costs of the project. Postdoctoral fellowships, third country organizations can host postdoctoral researchers from EU member states or associated countries, again, up to two years at the cost of the project. And in co-fund, again, you can host pre-doctoral and postdoctoral researchers from the EU and associated countries for one third of the duration of the project. So please refer to the funding guide for more information. So these are just the very basics. So I would like to recommend that you refer to the presentation that will be uploaded on our website and also the daily posts via SNS from MSCA, um, again, Marie Sklodowska-Curie Actions, on Twitter 
LinkedIn and Facebook. This page at the moment refers to how to apply. At the very top, you can see the funding and tender opportunities portal that provides the most extensive explanation on how to actually go through the process. And at the very bottom, very tellingly, you can see that the MSC and national contact point is also a useful source for you. These are called NCPs. We actually had several webinars with NCPs in the past, and I would like to invite you to refer to our YouTube channel for past recordings on webinars. As you can see, some of the calls have past deadlines and some are actually nearing the deadline. So I recommend that you reach out to partner organizations and submit your applications well in advance. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and the MSCA website are your best bet when looking for details on how to apply. SNS sites, we are on Facebook, Twitter, Line, LinkedIn, and we actually have two websites. One of them is in English, as you can see, the other one is in Japanese. The second works in collaboration with Kobe University, and the first is the official European Commission Eurofast Japan website. Thank you. That was my info bite. Thank you for coming today. And uh, again, a huge applause, Victoria, for the very detailed <laughs> presentation. Thank you so much. Please check out yeah. our website, SNS, and the presentation will become available on our website. With that, I would like to say goodbye. All right. Bye, everyone.